Uh, obviously, your characters are extremely personal to you. I just wanted to know that out of Theon Greyjoy and Jamie Lannister, which would you be most proud to have as a son? It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think maybe... Bran would be a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it depends on what kind of father I was. Uh, there, uh, there's a lot of father-son stuff in the books, which, uh, you know, um, is something I'd like people to, to think about. Um, there's a lot of mother-daughter stuff in the books, too, of course. Um, that is one thing I, I, I wish I could uh, do more of it. That I didn't do enough of in Game of Thrones before I ripped the Starks apart. I, I would have liked to have shown more scenes with a uh, cat actually interacting with her uh, her two daughters. And the kids. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, there are scenes of her interacting with the with the, the boys, but not so much yeah. the the girls. That's because uh, they're doing girly things, uh, like doing sewing. Work. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, and stuff like that. And Cat is very busy running her castle. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. uh, I mean, there is the the uh, the scene in in the uh, first season where you uh, you and yeah. Sophie are. are you know, you're brushing her hair, hair, and right. she's talking about what a dreamboat Joffrey is. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And she yeah. wants to marry him right now and right then. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course, that's it. <laughs> that, that scene is not actually in the book. So yeah, was, I know. I think that was uh, like David, David and Dan, Dan having work. a yeah. laugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, those are always fun scenes, see. That's one of the things I, I, I wish, uh, and I've told David and Dan this from the beginning, I wish we had more hours. Um, because we, we, we have 10 hours, um, but like Boardwalk Empire is 12, and, and Treme had like 13, and, and you know, I, some of these other HBO shows have slightly longer seasons than us. We're hitting all the high spots, but we, uh, there are little personal scenes like that one yeah. um, that I think we could have more of, including some reach. scenes from the books that, um, that deepen the characters mm-hmm. and their relationship. And if we had more time, we could do it. But of course, time is money, and our, the show is already very expensive. And uh, David and Dan have made it clear that their heads would explode if they had to do three more episodes yeah. a season. Uh, I don't know how those guys are surviving it anyway. My job is easy compared to theirs. But in reply to your question, Jamie Lannister. Um, hey, um, we've seen with Bran and also the Red Queen, like the power of the Lord of Light and also the Old Gods, but is there a particular reason why we haven't heard from the Seven yet? I don't... I'm not sure what you mean by heard from, uh, you know, a, a postcard, a telegram. Uh, <laughs> Email. <laughs> I, I don't intend, none of these gods have been on stage. I'm, I mean, people believe in them, just as people believe in the seven. Uh, but um, I, I don't intend to ever actually bring a god on stage and have him interacting with people. I'm not sure any of the gods in Westeros are real. Uh, I'm not sure that any of the gods in real world are real. Uh, I'm I'm uh, a doubter in that sense, um, which is not to undermine, not to say that the people who believe in them don't don't uh, believe in them. I mean, in in the books, I think the uh, the seven can be seen most strongly in some of the Davos chapters. Uh, you know, I recall the the this section where Davos lives through the Battle of Blackwater and is found clutching this rock and, and is saved, he really does feel that the, the mother, he had a vision of the mother and she appealed, appeared to him and he feels that the, the Seven are instructing him to kill Melisandre. So uh, his faith in the Seven is uh, driving some of his, uh, his beliefs. Uh, and Caitlin in the book mm-hmm. also has a, has a certain religious, religious faith in, in the Seven. She placed it Seven, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, but um, other than that, you know, it works on a on a more I don't know thematic and symbolic function than a literal one. 
Um, my question is about considering how many projects you have going, you've got the calendars, you've got the books, the show, writing the actual, you know, finishing the books. How do you quarantine your writing time? Do you just have months where you, you go home and you shut yourself off or is it – how do you actually – find the time along with everything that comes along with having a wildly successful series? Well, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't write when I travel. And I know some people, some of my fans are very upset about that and think I should, but you know, believe me, I've tried. I, I uh, you know, back in the 90s and uh, even the 80s when I, I would take a, a laptop, uh, they, they were new then and kind of heavy. Uh, it was like a briefcase, but I would take them on trips uh, when I was going to Europe or something like that, and I would try to write in my hotel room or try to write on the plane, and it, it would be very frustrating. I'm a creature of habit. I, need, I can only write. I, I don't want to be disturbed. I tell people, you know, don't, don't bother me. Don't put through any phone calls. Nobody come in here. Leave me alone all day. Uh, that's when I write. So I don't write when I travel. But when at home, I work almost every day. Now, do I write fiction almost every day? Well, I try to. But sometimes life conspires against that too. There's, you know, the, there's a lot of good stuff about the level of success I've had, but it also brings with it certain consequences in a tremendous amount of mail and email and business stuff. I've been hiring assistants to try to take some of that off my shoulders, but um, it's not something I'm getting used to. I'm, I'm still, still learning how to delegate stuff. Um, and I do think, frankly, uh, to, to be honest with you guys, I, I have to learn to say no more, um, particularly when this thing really started burgeoning, even before the show. I mean, the last few years when it was hitting the, the bestseller lists uh, very high, I started getting a lot of invitations to other projects and a lot of invitations to travel, and I, I try to keep my word and keep my promise. When I give a commitment, I, I, I go through with it. And I said yes to a lot of things that sounded like fun, uh, whether it's a, a convention or a, a book tour or um, interviews uh, and other projects. Uh, I love doing other projects. I love editing books. I love uh, writing short stories. I have other stories that I want to tell that are not nice and fire. So I said yes to a lot of things, and then a little few years into it, I was saying, why did I say yes to all these things? I have to learn to say, to say no occasionally here. Uh, and I've joked about that on my, on my blog. I talk about all the monkeys on my back, but uh, I, I have, would not have felt right uh, canceling those obligations once I had taken that on. I, I don't do that. Um, so I've been doing them, but one by one, I've been getting the monkeys off my back, and there, there are much fewer monkeys. It's not the big one, of course, is Winds of Winter, and that's King Kong, and the, the sh my obligations to the show were also up there, and that's Son of Kong, but uh, the other monkeys are <laughs> relatively small or dead, uh, so uh, I'm doing the best I can is all I can say. Uh, I think we've got time for one more. I think we can get one more question from down here. <clears throat> so make it the best one. The best. Okay. <laughs> pressure. Um, no pressure there. Yeah. yeah. George, people have such a sense of ownership of your work to the point where if they see you're not working on them, they get really angry. And I think we've all seen some pretty disgusting things that have been said on the internet about that. Oh. Now, personally, I think those people can go fuck themselves. Oh. <laughs> but... Do you just put that out of your mind when you're writing or has it affected you in some way? And do you think sometimes, uh, you know, maybe I, maybe I should be writing more? You know, I, I, I always think, uh, well, always is too big a word, but I, I frequently think I should be writing more. But then again, I always have, you know. I mean, this is one thing that I think some of the people who are critical of me don't, don't seem to understand, no matter how many times I say it, is that I've always been a slow writer. It's just nobody was aware of it because they weren't waiting on me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote my, my first uh, four novels without a contract, you know, which is very unusual. I mean, mostly in, in, in the publishing business, you do, you do a, a sample chapter or two, and then you do an outline of the rest of the book, and your agent sends around their publishers, and then you get a contract with a deadline. 
I didn't want to do that because I didn't want the deadlines. Um, I, I knew that would, I don't like deadlines. So I, w I wrote entire novels, Dying of the Light and Fever Dream and so forth. Nobody even knew I was working on those novels. I just sat all by myself. I wrote it and it was completely done. I sent it to my agent and said, uh, here it is, here's a novel, sell it. And they did. Um, ideally, <laughs> that would be the way I would work on this too. But uh, uh, of course you can't do that with a, with a series of any, any sorts. Um, but I, there are days, even when I write 10 pages, that I wish I'd written more. Oh, damn, I, I ran out of steam. I should have written 12 pages. But uh, not that I write 10 pages often in a day. That's a lot of work. But uh, Do you find I, it a pressure, George? Oh, that yeah. Constant? I, I, I do find pressure. And, and uh, you know, I think all writers have, have uh, or, well, maybe not all, uh, Many writers have deep insecurities. I don't know. Somehow it's something that feeds the writerly personality. And I suspect actors have this too. Uh, you know, you, you get a hundred good reviews and you get one bad review. The, and the bad what, one just obsesses you, right? That's why I don't read them, yeah. You don't read mm. your reviews? No, never, huh. never. No, because I think it's, it is that classic thing. If you re believe the good, you've got to believe the bad, you know, so... Mm -hmm. I don't read them. Um, so I don't know. Was that? Did I answer the question? I, I've lost track here. Um, so. Ultimately, you you have to try to put that stuff aside. Uh, and when the work is going well, I, I do put that stuff aside. You know, I I shut myself off in my office, and I forget that everything exists. That the, my publishers are waiting for the book, or the fans are waiting for the book. Um, I forget about the show. I, I, I'm just in Westeros. I'm in. I'm with some particular character with Arya or Bran or Sansa, and I'm in a scene and I'm wrestling with the words. Okay, what what do they say next? How do I say that? How do I describe what's happening? How do I make it vivid and evocative? And you know, I beat my head against a sentence, and nothing else enters that. It's just me in that sentence wrestling in in the pit at that point. You know, afterwards, when I shut off the computer for the day and, and go over, maybe other things enter my mind, but not that. I can't ever be distracted from, from that. Well, I think we're all prepared for you to take as much time as you need to, because we know that when the book comes, it will be absolutely perfect and amazing, and no one will die. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Michelle Fairley, George R. R. Martin. Yes.